November the 14th. Is that correct, Caroline? I will get the date and the registration link put in the chat for attendees. Absolutely. Okay, so again, good morning. And again, please keep your lines on you. Um, our first speaker um, is our presenter, Mr. Kyle McWilliams. Um, he is here from our uh, Columbus, Ohio, for Cineas office. Um, and he has brought a, an assistant with him, Ms. Valerie Dernwald. So I will turn over the presentation to them. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So just a background, Kyle, you want to? Yep. So I, so I started in dialysis 20 years ago as a PCT, been a nurse, been a clinical manager. Now I'm an area team lead. Um, so essentially last November, two of my clinics actually were enrolled in the Healthy Living QIA. Um, so this is essentially the plan we made for that and the plan we're using for 2024, what we're going to present today. Um, two clinics I want to I want to shout out were FMC Clayton Taylor uh, with Brandy Hupp and Liberty Mid America with uh, Lakeisha Scott, and then I have Val Dernwell here with me today. She's our clinical quality manager. She works really closely with my team to uh, you know go over all of our quality indicators, and, and she worked uh, a lot with the Healthy Living Project. Mm -hmm. So this is a team approach to vaccinations, and we really want to stress that with every quality metric, team approach is key. So we really want to push um, everybody in the IDT playing an important role with vaccinations. Of course, as you know, important vaccinations for ESRD. I'm sure everybody on the call knows these flu, COVID, pneumonia. The Healthy Living Project was mainly focused most three we added hepatitis b in just because it's something you know we all have to do and we could easily add it into our project um we have very very good processes for flu pneumonia hepatitis b covid is still kind of a wild card as i'm sure you guys know so it's a little bit of sometimes extra steps figuring out where to get the vaccine how to get the vaccine which vaccine it is now you know everyone knows that so um, but those are just the general, you know, of course, important vaccines for dialysis patients. Not letting me advance, so just one second, please. Okay, so prior to vaccine initiation, this is key, um, most important piece and our biggest area for improvement. And we wanna meet with the entire team. So that may be at different times, it may be huddles out in your facility with your direct patient care, and it could be at your coffee meeting with your medical directors, your dietitians, social workers, and your secretary. You wanna engage your entire team to have the common goal. Because sometimes in, in past experiences, we've identified maybe some people on the team were not as engaged. So we wanna make sure that they're engaged and are on board with what our goal is. And we wanna co collaborate on best practices. What's gonna work for one facility may not work at another facility. So you wanna determine as a team what's gonna work best for your facility. Um, that could include a staff or patient incentive. We've seen that, um, clever bulletin boards, lobby education, um, I actually just recently saw at a clinic visit, they're doing um, take your flu vaccine and get a piece of pie, just different little incentives. So um, also staff incentives work really well at some of the facilities. Mm -hmm. I don't know, have you seen any? Oh yeah, doing like, <laughs> uh, you know, give, give all the staff a uh, group of patients and, you know, whoever gets the highest percentage, um, but really just a team approach. Um, you know, it, it's so important, you know, that you make uh, that you make a good plan that fits your clinic, you know. So if you, you know, if you have a 50% pneumovax penetration, you don't want a 90% goal within 90 days. Make realistic plans, make realistic goals, but decide all that at the beginning. Have your meeting, you know, you almost have to have a pre-meeting with 
with you know the CM and the kind of the leaders, but you know address the goals, work for engagement, talk you know discuss your talking points, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later. Um, next is develop measurements and deadlines. Um, how do we measure success? Is it just the number or process improvement? Uh, as we all know, you know, new patients are key to long-term success. That might not show up overnight. Um, can we track our new patient penetration? Put deadlines in place to review and see what works and what doesn't for your clinic, and then update your plan. You know, so it's about the. Uh, of course, we have all learned from IPRO the plan, do, study, act, and then repeat. So. And then finally, gather and distribute your paperwork, you know, education, consent, VIS. Do we have the vaccines available that we need? Uh, can we get COVID vaccines? What's the process for that within our company? Um, so that's essentially, that's essentially your pre-meeting. And then next would be some of the roles. So with the roles, we're going to kind of go through each one. Our physician obviously is um, a trusted member for the patient. So we want them to help us with education. We want them obviously to order the vaccines and to stress the importance of the vaccines with the patients. And then also circling back, this is a very important piece, circling back with patients that are resistant and declining the vaccine to re-educate and stress the importance of them being immunocompromised and needing the vaccines. Next, our clinical manager, charge nurse, is the team leader. They're going to spearhead the whole thing. Um, they want to review the declinations, report often quappy meetings, track trends, and they want to keep the whole project in order. So they're the ringleader. Our RNs, we're going to have maintain our documentation, educate the patients on the vaccination and the importance, and then obviously they're going to administer the vaccinations. And uh, PCTs, so PCTs, reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. Often PCTs are the most trusted staff for our patients. So we're gonna, we're gonna hit on that here in a little bit, but PCT can be one of the most important parts of your plan, really, because uh, you have a, you know, you have a patient that's not sure Sometimes that PCT, they have the best, you know, the best relationship with social worker. Uh, social worker should be talking to every uh, declination. Um, they should be promoting vaccines during their monthly visit. The same with the dietitian, promoting vaccines during their monthly visits. Um, and even as far as the administrative assistant, you know, spread the word, hang up education, do bulletin boards, talking points in the lobby. Um, it's a very important role that's often underlooked and often not given a um, given, you know, a task. And even on to our biomeds, they can reinforce this. Uh, we have a story about that later. So um, that's essentially every role. Um, also, circling back with social worker too, a big piece is using that focused intervention tools that are available, um, motivational Absolutely. interviewing to find out the causes or reasons that they are declining. So that's Absolutely. a big piece in this too. Okay, best practice for your clinic. So we want to um, pick resources that are going to work best for your patients. Know your patients, which res resources are going to work the best and for all of the patients in your clinic. So you may have like there's different um, health equity. So mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we're supplying education that's going to work for each of our patients. Right. You want to you really want to make sure you're hitting that education level and make sure that you're you know, you don't you don't want to talk down to your patients. And you don't want to make it so your patients can't understand. So, uh, you know, you may need different education for different patients. Um, next is a really important thing, and I maybe the most important thing we did in our plan is identify trusted staff. Um, if a patient's previously declined vaccines, is there a staff member that has a good rapport with that patient, no matter who it is? You know, um, is it, you know, can 
if, for those patients that aren't sure, do they have a favorite PCT? You know, work as a CM, work with that PCT, you know, talk to them, set it up. But I just identifying those trusted staff and then letting them kind of lead the conversation. You know, it doesn't, doesn't get everybody, but it got us a few more last year. So, um, and then you gotta find, figure out who will follow up on declinations, this is, again has to be a team approach. Utilize the social worker, physician, CM, RN, along with the trusted staff if identified. Um, delegate tasks, assign clear roles, which we talked about. Um, but what if your clinic doesn't have a CM? What if your clinic short staff? Um, plan and delegate according to your clinic, clinic needs and have that meeting according to your clinic needs. And then finally, how will you track data? Uh, does your company track data or will you utilize uh, IPRO or state resources? Um, Ohio has a site for flu vaccines. Um, we have to track some of the data points yourself if you're if you're kind of looking at your new patients. So you got to really fit everything together for what works works with your clinic. Okay, next going on to approaching your patient. So we're going to kind of go through a correct and incorrect way. We're going to start with the incorrect way. And I've seen this so many times when I do clinic visits. Um, I'll see the nurse approach and say, do you want this vaccine? That really makes it easy to say no for the patient. Um, it doesn't stress the importance. Um, so we definitely want to present ourselves and say there's the importance that the physician wants them to take the vaccine. Um, and then the doctors ordered this vaccine for you today. Um, would, would you like to get it today? Or can we set that up for the next treatment? Um, the physicians trusted, we wanna make sure to include them when we approach them about the vaccine. And we're giving a statement and not a question. So they're gonna be more apt to take the vaccine. Yeah, when, and when you have, when you, when you say, do you want this vaccine to patients? You may have a lot of patients that are kind of middle of the road uh don't really care either way but it's just less of a hassle for them to say no so just talking about that importance you know it's just very important talking about your physician you know most of your patients want to do what the physicians ordered so use that to your advantage and then next was this is <laughs> kind of a funny slide but these are all true things that we have heard in our area from patients that did not want to receive vaccine. So the so first one was my mother had a heart attack after getting the flu vaccine. That's one I heard personally. Mm -hmm. uh, the vaccine is a way of the government controlling the population. That one was from one of my points. Mm -hmm. The vaccine has a tracker in it. That was one I heard personally. Um, I heard back that vaccines give you ED. That was not one I heard personally, but one from a local clinic and the vaccine changes your DNA. So, you know, kind of a little bit of levity there, but there's a lot of misinformation out there. And essentially you have to combat that. And this this is some of the hardest, you know, if somebody says one of these things to you, that's some of the hardest, uh, one of the hardest patients, you know, to deal with, to try to get a vaccine, so. And I'm sure everybody that's on this call has experienced many stories and we have many stories to tell to add to this absolutely <laughs> so in this this next slide is kind of vaccine administration but also ma managing that misinformation um so utilize your talking points you know know your audience tailor your talking points utilize trusted staff again you know if you have a patient that has said one of those quotes from the previous slide, it's gonna go a lot farther if their favorite tech is talking to them or they have a real good relationship with the AA, so the AA is talking to them. Um, and then this is so important, try, then try again, keep trying. Everyone has a bad day. If it's not the right day to discuss with the patient, come back to the next treatment, send somebody else to follow up, if your follow-up fails, figure out, figure out who's up next, have a plan, <laughs> keep trying. And then finally, uh, be aware of true contraindications. If 
If the patient has a true contraindication, ensure the entire team is aware during the planning stage. Um, if a new true contraindication arises during the administration period, speak with the physician and engage the team because we don't want to keep going back to the patient. If your team is all gung-ho about the vaccines that has a contraindication and keep asking them to get a vaccine, of course. So just be aware of those true contraindications. Okay, so reaching new patients. One thing that is, I stress is very important that I've seen many times, just implementing this process, and that's putting the um, in the new patient paperwork all of your cons consents for vaccines and your VIS. That step has really improved vaccines in our Absolutely. market um, because it's available right then and there when you're doing a lot of that education with that new patient. You can get those things signed and circle back. It just makes it a lot easier and it's a quicker process. Um, drawing that lab for the hepatitis, obviously on that first treatment, so you can kind of circle back and see if they do require a vaccine series. Um, educating them on increased importance of vaccinations for our ESRD patients. That's very important because you may have a patient that's been home for the last 10 years, but, you know, talk to them about how they're now out around, you know, a bunch of other patients. It's keeping them and their other patients uh, safe. You know, of course, we know patients with ESRD are more susceptible to vaccine preventable illnesses. You know, make sure they have education that even if they didn't always get vaccinated, it's more important now now that they're on dialysis, now that they're coming into contact with patients and staff on a regular basis. Then the RN reviewing the physician's order for vaccination, that's going to set the tone that the physicians ordered the vaccine um, for all eligible patients and that it's an expectation of the physician that the patient receive it due to them having the low immune systems. Ensuring the vaccines are always in stock. This prevents delays in vaccination. So you may have your vaccine drive twice a year, but you still want to hit those new patients that come in in the middle of those. So make sure you always have your vaccines in stock. Um, make sure every clinic has at least two staff members that order count, check for expired stock, so. And finally is our, this is essentially our post-vaccine meeting. So after you've had your pre-meeting, after you've administered, after you've Going back to all those uh, declinations with the team, we're going to meet with the entire team post initiative. But once again, this might have to happen in small meetings. A good time to do this is QAI and then maybe huddles with the floor staff. Um, make it fun, make the pre meeting fun, drive that engagement. Um, make it, you know, make it something your staff want to buy into because you'll get so much better results if the staff are engaged. Um, we're going to look at if we achieved our goals, look at the numbers, but don't forget the process. How many new patients do we vaccinate? How many previous declinations do we vaccinate? If your process is solid, celebrate success with the realization that long-term success may be more visible from a data standpoint. It might take a little longer, you know, to really get the data goals you want, but as long as you have good process, keeping up on, uh, you know, re renewing your plan, updating what works, um, and then uh, hitting those new patients over time, you know, your goal, your data points should go up. Um, what were our barriers? Uh, do we have the level of staff engagement Do we want that we wanted? Did everyone hold up their end? Did we do well combating misinformation? Um, look at your barriers. Of course, that's something we always do in our copy you know, same same kind of thing. Um, how do we main to maintain sustainability? Keep what worked and go back to the drawing board for what didn't. Look closely at your plan and results to ensure the good is continued so we can focus next time on what didn't work as well. So focus on, you know, keep the good throughout the bad, start again. Of course, it's just a constant process and then celebrate su success with staff and patients. That's my favorite part, celebrating yeah. the success. <laughs> yep. which will drive future engagement. So this was a bulletin board that was in one of our, the two clinics that um, that was in the QIA project. It was our huddle board. 
you know, it has the uh, intervention, the barriers. We updated this, you know, during during the vaccine initiative. And then a little bit of uh, practical results. So now this plans, this QIA started in November 2023. So this is our, really our first full year of like a flu vaccine going into no, winter. No, we are the black woman. We are the black managers, the black leaders. So guess what? The white one, them said Somebody's unmuted. Oh, there you go. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, so yeah. the so this plan was implemented, like I said, in two clinics, Clayton Taylor, Liberty Mid America. Mid America actually reached a high of eighty percent flu vaccine rate. They didn't in there, but we reached a high of eighty, and that's the highest we've ever had. I've been at that clinic for ten years, and I know back at least fifteen years, and they've never had a, at eighty before. So we were very proud of that. Um, Pneumovax COVID hepatitis B rates remain steady. You know, and that's one of those things. I think we have a much better process. I think those numbers will come up. You know, a new patient that we might not have gotten engaged two years ago might not get another vaccine, but that new patient that we got engaged to you know, this season probably will get it every year. Um, so both clinics expect increased vaccination rates for 2024, 2025, as the plan is fully in effect for this year. And then I'll tell the success story. Yeah, this is so Val's this is story. a success story that I had at one of my facilities. Um, obviously, Mrs. Smith is a made-up name, and Tom, the biomed, is also. So, um, Mrs. Smith had been on dialysis for 14 years, had never received flu vaccine for our facility. Um, she had taken it one time prior to being on dialysis and said it made her sick. Um, Tom, the biomed, was she really. Um, developed a rapport with Tom and Tom would come in when he would be looking at machines and things and talk to her. She really liked Tom. Um, so we decided to see if Tom would take his flu vaccine at the same time that Mrs. Smith would take hers to see if she would be willing to get a flu vaccine that year and he take the flu vaccine at the same time together. So two nurses got together. She did agree to it. Um, they took their vaccine together and literally first time in 14 years so that was a huge success and also it kind of shows looking outside the box to see what we can do um, to help get these patients vaccinated because of them having the low immune systems and needing the vaccine right. so it was a, a huge success story and it really shows about how you measure success because that one patient might not show up in your numbers but that's a huge that's a huge success story. So um, next, and I know you guys will be getting this. This this is a lot of the things we used. This is all from iProLearn. You may have to sign into iProLearn to get on these links, but I'm sure everybody can sign in. Um, this is a lot of stuff we use. Just um, I really recommend the bottom one, a change package to increase vaccinations. It, it's like a whole plan in and of itself. So. Um, take a look at that, you know, um, and utilize those in your plans. And I'm going to give you some kudos because I know we joke about the iPro Learns and, oh, no, we have to do our iPro Learns, but there are some really good resources on here really for are. you guys to use. Absolutely. So. <laughs> Absolutely. And last is questions. So if anybody has any questions, you can take yourself off a of mute and ask the questions. But there is one in the chat box. Um, Kyle, what pneumonia vaccine do you administer at your facility? We get both the you have to help me. No, it's the number. 20. We just started the 20. Oh, we just started we switched the to the 20. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we do recently. We were doing both. the 13 and the yes, 23. Right. So we switched, we switched to, to the, the 20. 20. Sorry. You asked me too no fast. Problem. No problem. Um, another question came in the chat. What are some of the best practices for addressing the anti-vaccine culture, which has significantly evolved due to COVID-19 uh, misinformation, disinformation? I think the biggest thing is re using, utilizing all of your team, um, establishing who in that clinic has a good rapport with that patient. And definitely, like Kyle said before, like circling back over, retry, retry. Um, hopefully somebody can break through the barriers and help get that patient vaccinated and some of your staff may 
feel that way as well. Mm -hmm. But even just letting your staff know that, you know, if they feel that way, sure, but they want to, you know, you want that you want to push the com the company and IPRO and the you know the initiatives of vac vaccinating kind of your personal feelings out of it because there are a lot of staff that kind of feel that way too. Uh, of course, everyone knows COVID was crazy, you know, and so we're still dealing with that. But just keep you know utilizing those trusted staff and then just keep you know. And I think too with the social workers, those focused interventions are great tools. I pulled them one day and I was kind of looking through and there are some really good tips on how to, to talk with patients and use that motivational interviewing too. I think too many times we just start giving like it's just like we just start giving the vaccine. It's really important to have that meeting. Get the team on the same page. That'll help as well. Nice, beautiful. Uh, there was a comment in the box. That was a nice story about the patient, the biomed technician. So glad for the positive outcome. Um, another question came up. How do you determine which pneumonia vaccine to start with? So we used to do the 13 and the 23, but we only do the 20 now. Now we just do the 20. So, so we ha we actually have a, a guideline yeah. that we follow. Um, so before, prior, it was the 13, and then you waited, and then you did the 23, but now it's just the 20. And I would makes just, it very easy. <laughs> I, would say, I would say the best answer is probably refer to your company's policy, you know, because every, everybody's going to have a policy for that. So. Absolutely. Because everybody might give a little different vaccines, but you should definitely have a policy. Absolutely. And I also want to just add a, a touch of information. Um, the CDC uh, website provides a VAX uh, pneumo advisor, basically a medication advisor that literally follows the prompt. So um, it's like a three to five questions. You implement the vaccine that you either offer at your facility or that the patient has received. And you answer the questions exactly as it says, um, did the person receive a 13? Did this person receive a 15? Did they receive a 23? Um, are are they over the age of 65? You just follow the questions and it literally gives you the actual um, vaccine administration at the end. It'll tell you if it's a one and done with the 20 or if it's the 23 that you need to administer again. So um, I, I recommend that because it makes your life so much easier. You can answer the question for that every patient. Great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every patient, even your teammates. Um, and it tells you exact. it's just an algorithm, um, you know, electronically. Um, are there any other Absolutely. questions? I actually have a question. Um, in regard, I, I, let me first say I do love the idea of inclusivity with your administration packet, including the consents to make it so much easier. So it's not like a far fetched idea or it's not even just kind of thrown upon a patient because they're already overwhelmed coming into the facility with all the you know guidelines and obviously the diagnosis. Um, but one of the questions I wanted to ask, um, and your huddle board was absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> I will say that Thank with you. the healthy living. Um, did the campaign draw engagement with the patients, seeing something totally new um, being administered in your facilities? You know, it did with a lot. Um, I think they definitely noticed um, the change and, and it was definitely talked about. Now, of course, there was some people that we still couldn't reach that, you know, were set, set in their ways. But I think the engagement was definitely noticed by everyone and appreciated by, you know, 80, 90 percent. So, yeah. So sometimes you get to that point where somebody's like, no, stop asking me, you know. So <laughs> you got to be aware of that, of course, you know, but just work in your plan, you know, and keep trying and, you know. It's each one teach one and it's about culture change. It's not you're not supposed to reach everybody at the same time. Everybody right. comes in in exactly. ways. But again, if you if you can reach one, you can reach many in the later time period. And again, with the new processes that you're doing in your facility, then it will definitely make a huge impact. Um, this has been a great presentation, Kyle and Valerie, and I do appreciate um, you presenting to the entire uh, team and, and all the network. Uh, we are now going to transfer back to Kyra Line. If you have any other additional questions, you can put in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So 
We're now going to switch to our second speaker. Um, this topic is all about the pillars of success for kidney transplant um, outreach and advocacy. Um, so I'll give our speaker an introduction and then we're going to go through the pillars of success that um, her and her facility have put into place to find uh, transplant excellence. So just an introduction, um, Deborah Galprin's here with us today. She's a seasoned social worker with over 43 years of experience, including the last 30 years dedicated to nephrology. Uh, she's based in New York. Deborah has a deep passion for working in chronic illness where a team approach is essential. She values the unique relationships that each team member has with patients and their families, finding fulfillment in educating and guiding them through their healthcare journey. Under her leadership in transplant, Deborah's dialysis facility has achieved remarkable success, getting 10 new patients on the wait list and 22 patients transplanted in the last year and a half. The photo that you see on the screen is actually her team photo that she has shared with us today. So you can see everybody who's involved in all of this success. And I will turn it over to Debbie to uh, walk us through her achievements. And you, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Okay. Hi. So initially, I feel like my goal is to communicate, to communicate to the patients, the families, the staff, the transplant centers so I can have success. So I do it in a variety of ways. As you see in the picture there, that's what I call my transplant Bible. It helps me to remain organized and updated. It's available to staff in my office all the time. The person who has find it most valuable is our technician because sometimes she's not sure if the patient is active or not active or the patient says they're listed because I've referred them. So she can go to the Bible and look, I have it organized by center and then each center, the patient has their own little folder alphabetical so it's easy to find and then I have the most updated letter from a transplant center or what's going on so you can see the most recent and that's really been helpful. In front of each center I keep the quarterly report that the transplant centers have sent me. I'm trying really hard lately to incorporate what I like from each center's report to come up with a more universal report that includes when I referred them, when they started their evaluation, uh, what tests they still need if they started, what the transplant centers see as a difficulty. If a patient told them they cancel the colonoscopy, sometimes the center will say, call the scheduler. So I'm really trying to use that to help the patients. So that's my goal to get a more universal. The other thing I do is educate our staff as it takes a village to get all my patients on or interested in the transplant. So I have done lunch and learns with my staff to educate them about transplants, some of the barriers, what tests have to be done just to they're well informed. I also have lobby days with the transplant centers and a lot of times during lunch I have the outreach workers meet with the staff so they can provide education. Some of the transplant programs have new programs like a living donor program so I've had the representative from the living donor program come in to educate my staff because again sometimes the tech, the nurse, will hear from the patient, well, I really want my, you know, sister to give me a kidney and they don't know how to approach it. So at least they'll have knowledge that there's a living donor program. They'll be able to help you. So the more information I'm able to give my staff, it helps me, it helps the patient and we enhance the communication and hopefully enhance the number of people who are interested in pursuing it. Next is building bridges. I constantly, constantly talk to the transplant centers. Uh, I prefer sometimes, you know, on the phone or face to face. The quarterly report is great. Sometimes it's a little delayed, so I'll make a call because, again, if I'm going to tell the patient, you need this, you need that done, I need to know if they have it done because the patients will say, oh, I went to the doctor, I had my history and physical, where is it? W was it the nephrologist? Was it the internist? So I really have to work closely with the transplant centers. I also try to help focus them on completing the tests. 
So that's bridging the gaps. You know, I have to assess sometimes what are the barriers? Is it the patient's motivation? Is it the transportation? Is it the ambivalence that they have about even getting someone else's kidney, a deceased kidney or a living related? And I help really try to address those issues. And I communicate, again, with the transplant centers, what my struggles are. So that's building those bridges. Another way of educating, which we haven't done in a while since a COVID, has been patient seminars. I have, in the past, a panel of patients, approximately eight patients, and we try to pick the patients who've had transplants in different centers. Also, they would have a living related, having a deceased. I pick patients who have gone to Hackensack, to Westchester, to Montefiore, you know, who have made the effort even maybe to, they have family in Florida, have gone to a Florida unit. I pick patients who are young, old, educated, not educated, to really give a variety of patients so the patients who do attend feel comfortable and can relate. Because at the end of the day, patient to patient sometimes just works better than professional to patient. They feel that they can relate and they feel comfortable. What we do to enhance this seminar is we have like questions, about five questions that every panelist has to answer. And, you know, we have positive and negative outcomes. Patients who had a short wait list, people who had a long wait list, people who had to go back in and out of the hospital post-transplant. So we really try to give a real picture to the patient. And then the patients have the opportunity to ask questions. And that's really been helpful. I saw that as increasing the number of interest because, again, staff can tell them, we can tell them, but sometimes it's the patient to patient they've either sat next to or they remember, you know. So it really has worked in getting more patients at least interested. And I'd like to start that again now that we are a little less COVID. But again, it's yearly that we've done it. Sometimes it probably should be more than yearly because people have schedules and lives. But starting once a year would be perfect. All right. Advocacy. I constantly talk to the transplant centers. I try to find my contact person. I try to maintain communication. I try to meet the person face to face. I am open with the struggles I have with the centers. Again, things happen, staffing changes, short of staff, you know. So if you have that contact person, and that contact person could change as well, at least there's communication because I have to find solutions to the struggles that the patients are having so I can help resolve them. That's how I see my role as an advocate. And as she wrote here, the tip, remember there's hundreds of you, there's so many of us social workers trying to help our patients and there's one transplant outreach worker or two and one coordinator that has so many patients. So it really takes a lot of work to have that constant communication because everyone's busy and my goal is to keep working at it. So. So in this area, we have a bridge that separates us from two very large transplant centers. Now, both have tried to have satellites in our area. One started it, as it says, and Montefiore had it first. And we got a lot of patients to go there. But then with staffing issues and things like that and interest, they had to close it. Meanwhile, Westchester was opening one and patients were interested. I really kept talking to the Montefiore people saying how it's important because people want to do what's convenient for them. They don't know who's good, who's bad. As I always say, the best clinic, the best center is the one who gives you the transplant. So I really encourage them to go. And again, when it's local, it makes it much easier. Now, Montefiore is opened and we have more people going so I can share the wealth with, between Westchester and Montefiore so the patients don't have to go over the bridge. Mm -hmm. All right. So advocacy, it not just works with me and the patient. I really involve the families because sometimes the patients really need the family for support. So my one example is Mrs. F, a 55-year-old female 
Her primary language was Spanish. She relies on her daughter as her advocate. She didn't know when she started dialysis that even transplant was an option. So I educated both the patient and the daughter. I referred the patient, 10 12 22. Her first appointment, 11 17 22. Highly motivated. The daughter was getting married. They wanted her mother to be on a list and have everything done. They went for the tests. And then after about six, seven months, the patient kept saying, call my daughter. I'm not on a list. I call my daughter. I would call. She says she's working on the test. She had trouble in terms of getting a response back from the transplant center. Six months later, finally, I found out, yes, she had all the tests done, but the transplant center wanted her to go back for another echocardiogram and to see a breast surgeon for clearance because there's something they saw. Patient knew, spoke to the daughter, daughter advocated, was able to get her these tests done. Halt again. Now what's going on? The daughter calls me. The patient is upset. She wants the daughter's wedding is like around the corner and she didn't she not that she was going to get the kidney then, but she just wanted to like not be in the hospital just in case. I found out she had the breast surgeon and got clearance, but it wasn't being shared with the transplant center. I didn't have the report. I couldn't get the report. I involved the daughter. I said, get me the reports, send them to me, bring them to me. I got them. I sent it to the transplant center. She's listed at a 7324. The biggest problem that came out of this was that the, these tests were done at the hospital where, the trans, where she was trying to get on the transplant center. So the departments from the hospital didn't send it even over to the transplant center, knowing that the goal was to get her on the list. So again, family advocated for the patient. I advocated for the patient with the transplant center to give them a little more transparency that the tests that were done in their hospital that they scheduled were not being sent to them. So it worked. She still doesn't have a kidney, but she's doing well and she at least is active on the list. Case number three. So since I've been doing this a very long time, I do remember when patients did not get actively listed until they completed their assessment, and that was the day when they became active. So with I used to say to new patients, I know you're not ready yet, this is all new, but in two years from now, when you tell me I hate dialysis, I want a transplant, you're out two years because we didn't go back like we do now from day one of dialysis. So I think I started being pushy a long time ago and that hasn't left my demeanor. And I really push people to start because there are so many tests. And unfortunately, sometimes they find out they have to have more cardiac procedures prior. So the process isn't so quick. So I am pushy, but it works. So here's my story with Mr. K. Mr. K is a retired 71-year-old nurse. He active, his family was active. Yeah, oh, sorry. My, he was, went to a transplant center prior to starting dialysis. They told him he was too old. 71 was not so old in my eyes. He was a good 71-year-old, but he was devastated. That was prior to starting dialysis. He wanted to do PD. He was motivated to do PD, but he was a little sad because he couldn't pursue transplant. I told him, you can pursue it. There's other centers. I had to educate him. I had to encourage him. It took a while, but he started here January 9th. So a month later, February 5th, I referred him. Of course, perfect scenario, except now he has medical issues. Now he has an incarcerated hernia needed surgery, could no longer do PD, had to go in center, was depressed, didn't want to follow through with the tests, but he was halfway there. So I pushed and I pushed and he got all his tests done. He got listed October 4th. I got a call October 16th. He's transplanted. So he was happy. We were happy. But again, you have to really find where the patient wants to go, what he wants to do, and give the information to educate so they have the power to move on. But they need an advocate. They need an advocate. Mm 
and they need someone, I guess, who's a little pushy. And unfortunately, sometimes that's me, but it's worked. I mean, I've had 18 transplants last year. I had 12 already this year. You know, the goal is to get the same as last year, but I don't know. I'm just pushy, but I not giving my kidneys yet. So I don't know how I'm going to get more, but I keep trying. All right. All right. And um, that is nearly the end of Debbie's um, pillar case studies, but I wanted to add in a third uh, case study for her collaboration. So you've already kind of heard sprinklings of collaboration with, um, you know, family advocates and transplant centers um, and just pretty much the whole transplant system, essentially, and that's generated a lot of success. But um, I thought it was best to highlight her collaboration with us at the network, too. So I met Debbie probably, what, like six months ago was the mm -hmm. first time we, you called me and you said, I'm in this transplant community coalition. And if you guys have ever been involved in a community coalition, we try to increase waitlist and transplant. And um, Debbie's facility was selected to be a part of the coalition, although they were already high performers. And sometimes that just happens. And I gave her the opportunity to um, back out of the coalition due to specific circumstances, or she could continue and be a high performer and share her successes amongst other coalition facilities. She chose to stick around and maintain communication and stick, uh, stick with the group essentially. So with this phone call, <clears throat> we we continued talking and um, she needed uh, assistance with a contact for, I can't even remember, remember, but I said, you know, if if you could help me, actually, I can't get a hold of this transplant center either for a project that I was working on. And she put me in contact with the outreach coordinator um, at a Montefiore transplant center. and. That connection and that collaboration between the network and Debbie allowed me to onboard Montefiore into our kidney transplant compare application. Um, I had pretty much hit a dead end and she kind of showed up out of nowhere and um, assisted me in completing um completing a, a critical step in success of this application that is available to all of you. And so um, I really wanted to give her a special shout out for um, the collaboration that she has assisted uh, the network in um, allowing all patients to achieve transplant success across um, the region. And a second thing, so that connection carried forward and the outreach coordinator that she had put me in contact with um, was the first center, uh, help the, the transplant center sign up for a new um, webinar series that we're launching uh, in the next couple of months. And so um, it's funny how the relationship kind of evolved and it all started with Debbie calling and just being very transparent. Um, hey, we're doing well. Why am I in this project? You know, and uh, very respectful, obviously not, uh, no confrontation at all, but just having open communication, advocating for her own time management, right, essentially. Um, and then through that relationship opened up doors for us at the network to help um, patients across New York. And so I just wanted to give a shout out, add that in here, because I do think it's relevant to um, all of the success that they see at their dialysis facility. So with that, we will transition to the question and answer portion of uh, Debbie's presentation. And I'm going to pull up the chat real quick. There's lots of kudos. Um, the first, uh, we have Uh, Carolyn, you're kind of breaking up a bit. I see. Can you let me know, is it better? Yes, okay. You're better. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, the patient seminars, how were the turnouts? How many patients attended? And did you notice any patients' interest shifted after the seminars? We had usually about 20 patients and family members come because, again, 
I think transplant, if you have a family member to be supportive, we encourage them to come, whether it's to the seminar or even your transplant evaluation. So much information is given out that sometimes it takes more than one person to remember everything that's being said. So about 20. And yes, it did increase the patient's interest in transplant. Wonderful. Um, we got some more kudos. Your patients are lucky to have you. That's excellent. A question was, what are your secrets to maintaining relationships with the transplant centers because they're so busy? So again, the local ones, I just constantly talk to, email, uh, question what's going on with a patient, where we're at. It's just constant communication. Again, it's not at every center because I don't have a relationship with every center, but it's at least four or five of our transplant centers around here. And that's worked. Wonderful. Okay. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, let me see. Did I hear, did I hear that patients are no longer gaining time once they start dialysis? Um, that example started back when patients wait time started when they were waitlisted. They do a backlog, I guess, time whenever they start dialysis. So if you were to get waitlisted today, but you've been on dialysis for three years, your time's going to start um, from three years ago, essentially. Um, it's whenever your GFR drops below the, um, the threshold. So I just wanted to clear that up. Uh, we have a hand raised from Annie. And go ahead and try to unmute yourself so we can hear you. Annie Mataga. And if you're having trouble unmuting, if you're able to type it into the chat, um, you can do so as well. Maybe it was an accident. Okay, any other questions um, for anybody on the call? Perfect. Okay, so um, thank you to all of our speakers today. I think this was an amazing um, call. Uh, I mean, we had vaccination speakers come on and talk about um, tangible things that we could implement to improve vaccination. I think that might be a first time that we were able to, that the network was able to highlight um, vaccination and best practice. And I, I know it's such a struggle um, and it resonates across all dialysis facilities. And so I'm very grateful that we had such amazing speakers come on to talk about that. Um, thank you so much, Debbie, for joining us today. Um, your impact in the transplant world uh, is um, invaluable. And I, I love hearing about everything you're doing because it gives hope that everybody can replicate that, you know, and um, there's a lot of things going against, you know, there's a lot of barriers to transplant. And it seems like you found over all of your years of experience, you found ways to kind of overcome them. And um, it's very motivating to hear about. And so I'm happy we could share that with all of our attendees today. Um, I am going, oh, I do have one question that popped up and said, do the transplant centers have age limits? Um, yes, most transplant centers actually have um, upper age limits. Uh, they range from 70 to 90 years old, typically. Some say they don't, but um, most, most have age limits. If you go on to Kidney Transplant Compare, you can actually see the documented upper age limit for every transplant center um, across the IPRO ESRD networks. So um, that resource is available right now. It's, it's, you can go to transplantcompare.org. I can put the links in the chat. Um, if you're curious about age limits for transplant centers amongst a lot of other criteria, um, go in and explore for the centers that are most local to you or wherever you're interested in receiving or, or referring your patients. Um, and then I am going to put in the chat right now the registration link to our call, next best practice call on November 6th. This one is all about um, building a pro-home culture. And so this is next um, next week. And go ahead and register for that, and we'll see you guys then. Um, thank you all for your time this morning. 
Uh, we'll stay on for a couple of uh, five more minutes or so um, if there are any um, questions, but you're free to go. I feel like my Teams is glitching now because everybody's leaving in mass. <laughs> um, perfect. Debbie, you're more than welcome. Um, if there's any questions, I'll forward them to you if you've got to run. Okay. I know. Right. Um, I know you're okay, busy. Okay, thank lady. you. <laughs> thank you so much. It was amazing. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.